Well, good afternoon. It's great to be here at the University of Calgary School of Veterinary Medicine. I'd like to thank uh, everyone who is in attendance. But before I get to today's, uh, the subject of today's announcement, I have to address a very important historic moment for Alberta's fight for fairness in the Canadian Federation. Uh, an hour ago, Alberta's appeal court released an historic decision striking down the Trudeau government's No More Pipelines law. This is a huge win for the people of Alberta, for their right responsibly to develop the res their resources, the resources that belong to the people of this province. Thanks to decades of hard work by previous Alberta governments, including Peter Lougheed's huge victory in enshrining Section 92A in Canada's Constitution, guaranteeing that provinces exclusively have the right to regulate the production of their natural resources. That's why our government committed to a constitutional challenge of the Federal Impact Assessment Act, Bill C-69, what we call the No More Pipelines Law, because of its massive overreach into provincial powers, creating huge uncertainty about how to develop natural resources and launch major projects right across our economy. When that bill was introduced, we saw it for what it was, an unconstitutional attack on the key powers of our province, but really the entire concept and promise of the Canadian Federation. We also saw it as an attack on our province's largest industry, which by the way, is Canada's largest industry, our energy sector, which employs over half a million Canadians and generates tens of billions of dollars of revenue to support institutions like this, university, schools and hospitals, healthcare and infrastructure, public services from the Atlantic to the Pacific. That's an industry which has played a massively oversized role as a great engine of social mobility, of equality of opportunity. Earlier today I spoke at the Indigenous Opportunities Corporation's first ever convention to celebrate the huge and growing success of First Nations in major resource projects. I want to thank, in fact, the Indian Resource Council for having been one of the many organizations, together with the provinces of Saskatchewan and Ontario, who intervened to support Alberta's constitutional challenge to the Trudeau No More Pipelines Law, which we filed at the Alberta Appeal Court for judicial reference about 18 months ago. It's been a long period waiting for this decision, but uh, today's victory is a huge vindication of Alberta's strategy to fight for a fair deal. Let me quote from the four to one majority decision of the Alberta Appeal Court today. They said, quotes, that the Federal Impact Assessment Act, quotes, constitutes a profound invasion into provincial legislative jurisdiction and provincial proprietary rights. They went on to say that, quotes, the unavoidable effect of the Impact Assessment Act would be the centralization of the governance of Canada to the point this country would no longer be recognized as a real federation. This is not what the framers of our Constitution intended, and it certainly is not what provincial governments agreed to either on patriation of the Constitution. They go on to say, where the natural resources are involved, it is each province that is concerned with the sustainable development of its natural resources, not the federal government. It is the province that owns those natural resources uh, uh, and uh, not the federal government. And it is the province and its people who lose if those natural resources cannot be developed, not the federal government. The federal government does not have the constitutional right to veto an intra-provincial designated project based on its view of the public interest. Nor does the federal government have the constitutional right to appropriate the birthright and economic future of the citizens of a province. Let me say, state this again. This is not Alberta. This is not me. This is four judges of Alberta's highest court where they say the unavoidable effect 
of Bill C-69 would be the centralization of the governance of Canada to the point that this country would no longer be recognized as a real federation and that the federal government does not have the constitutional right to appropriate the birthright and economic future of the citizens of a province. The effect of this decision today is to strike down as ultra vires, unconstitutional, that act, it is no longer in effect. This is a huge win for the people of Alberta, and I fully expect the Government of Canada will seek an appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, but let me put them on notice. The, I believe the majority of Canada's provinces will stand up for the Federation, for the Constitution, for jobs in the economy, by supporting Alberta when this reaches the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, now let me turn, I'm sorry, I'm a little pumped up uh, about that. I've got to... Uh, I, I, I've been waiting for this day for a long time, and it really, it really matters. Uh, it, it, I'll just close by saying, it, it matters for, for people who've been struggling in this province. It matters for the future of our economy. It matters as to whether or not this is actually a functioning federation. So I will now turn uh, to the subject of today's happy announcement. I'm here with Alberta's Minister of Advanced Education, uh, Dimitrios Nikolaidis, and our Minister of Forestry, Agriculture, and Rural Economic Development, Nate Horner, as well uh, as with the people from the University of Calgary, President Ed McCauley, the Dean of the U of C's uh, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Renate Weller, and Dr. Terry Balser, uh, Provost and Vice President, Academic, as well as uh, Dr. Natasha Kutrick, uh, Vice President of the Alberta Veterinary Medicine Association. I am thrilled uh, to be sharing more good news made possible through Alberta's recovery plan. Having a pool of skilled veterinarians is a key part in the, the well-being of our province. Veterinary medicine plays a hugely important role in our agriculture sector, and agriculture is a major pillar of our provincial economy. Uh, to maintain livestock and ensure that they remain healthy and disease-free is integral to the health and sustainability of the entire sector and of our economy. Large animal vets make that happen, in addition to providing critical emergency care when needed. So Alberta needs to stay at the forefront of veterinary medicine and care. In addition to providing this care, veterinarians play an important role in research, like the academic undertakings here at Spy Hill, to advance the agricultural industry by developing and promoting best practices. So today's announcement isn't just about veterinary medicine, but it's really about the recovery and growth of Alberta's economy as well. As important as, as the profession of uh, veterinary medicine is to Alberta, we are unfortunately facing a real shortfall of uh, vets uh, in our province. The ag industry is very aware of this shortage. I hear about it everywhere I go in rural Alberta, and late last year, the Alberta Veterinary Medical Association, the Alberta Veterinary Technologists Association, and the University of Calgary's Faculty of Vet Medicine, where we are, submitted information to our government uh, confirming the current widespread shortages of vet professionals in all areas of practice, but especially large animal vets. Alberta's vet workforce is currently short by an estimated 850 practitioners, and that number is set to grow. Meanwhile, demand for vet services, especially as I say, uh, large animals continues to go up, but the number of vet graduates in the province has stayed at the same level for decades. Now, this is largely due to our lack of training capacity in the past, where Alberta had a long-term partnership with the uh, Western College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan, uh, and uh, it served us well for a long time. Under that partnership, investment from Alberta's government to the college would guarantee a yearly allotment of about 20 seats for Alberta residents. But not being able to train and learn here at home meant that students were more likely to look for career opportunities outside of our province. So starting a couple of years ago, we ended that agreement and shifted the investment here to the U of C program so most, more students could learn here in their province. But we still face a shortfall of graduates overall, and that's no fault of the UFC uh, and this wonderful world-class facility. They've consistently produced great trained professionals. 
But as a province, we lack capacity to train enough new vets and uh, continue to fall short of what's needed out there. So today, we take the next steps to address this shortfall and to get more vets working in Alberta. With Alberta's recovery plan and the uh, Alberta at Work strategy that was in this year's budget, we committed to addressing structural labor, labor shortages across key sectors, and we're keeping our word. I'm pre pleased to announce two major investments to bolster Alberta's training capacity of veterinary professionals. First, we're addressing our physical capacity limitations by committing $59 million in capital funding over three years to develop new infrastructure for vet medicine training here at the U of C. Second, we're supporting enrollment growth with $8.4 million over three years to accommodate new seats for students here uh, at this program. Together, these investments will provide for facilities, faculty, and administration needed to grow the program in a sustainable way and allow more students to learn and practice vet medicine won't change our situation overnight. There's a lot of work needed to realize this expansion, and I know the U of C is eager to get shovels in the ground. And with today's announcement, we are one step closer to an Alberta-made solution that will help fix the shortfall and provide access to veterinary medicine that is needed to support our economy, especially in rural Alberta. So thank you uh, all for your continued work to support and grow post-secondary education. And thank you as well to all, all those who have chosen to become vets. I'd like now to pass the mic over to Minister of Advanced Education, Demetrius Nicolaides, to provide a little bit more information. And we'll hear from other speakers before taking questions. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us here today. And of course, uh, I want to thank uh, our Premier for making today's important investment in veterinary medicine. I also want to acknowledge and uh, uh, thank uh, President McCauley, Minister Horner, MLA Lovely, um, and everyone else who has put incredible work into helping achieve this important milestone. You know, as, uh, as Premier mentioned, Alberta's economy is taking off. And in many sectors of our economy, we are seeing significant new investment in the future, and the future of our province looks bright. Whether in film, television, tech, agriculture, or oil and gas, wherever you look, you see strong signs of growth and prosperity. However, this rapid pace of economic growth also brings its own set of problems, and one of these problems is the lack of available talent. Indeed, Employers from many sectors are expressing concern about not being able to hire the staff that they need. And one of the areas that is also experiencing similar shortages is in veterinary medicine. According to the Alberta Veterinary Medical Association, there are hundreds of unfilled vet positions in our province. However, as professionals and experts in this area have told me in the past, this is not just an Alberta problem, but in fact, a global issue. With an average of only 50 people graduating from the U of C veterinary program each year, it is clear that we must do more to increase the number of vet grads. The University of Calgary's Faculty of Veterinary Medicine began in 2004 when my predecessor, Minister Lyle Olberg, announced that the University of Calgary would become home to Canada's fifth veterinary college and the first of its kind in Alberta. Established eventually in 2005, the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine was created to ensure Alberta had the highly skilled graduates it needed. Since that time, the faculty has created a strong name for itself, ranking in the top 50 of veterinary programs worldwide. Indeed, the faculty has done an incredible job, but it now needs some more help and Alberta's government is proud to make today's investment to create the physical space needed for the school to grow and an additional investment in enrollment funding to hire the instructors needed to graduate more students. And of course, that is the core of today's announcement. And I'm pleased to talk a little bit more about this important investment. This new investment will ensure that the University of Calgary continues to excel in the field of veterinary medicine. Let me tell you a little bit more about what this investment will do. Firstly, 
it will create the physical spaces needed to add more students. The University of Calgary Faculty of Veterinary Medicine currently operates three sites, the Foothills Campus, the WA Ranches, and the Spy Hill Campus, where we are currently. Now simply put, the Spy Hill Campus is at capacity, and today's investment will enable the university to create additional space. This new space will include, as I've learned earlier today, new innovative lecture theaters and other teaching spaces. Secondly, today's investment will increase the number of graduates from this incredible program. By investing over eight million over three years, the school would be able to admit more students. As I learned as well, uh, there are currently seven times the number of applicants to the program than the institution is able to graduate. And so it is clear this program is in high demand and with limited spaces, admission into the program is highly competitive. Today's investment will allow more students to access this program and go on to rewarding careers in veterinary medicine. This is important because students in Alberta want to be able to access high quality post-secondary education right here at home. Today's investment will do just that. This funding will help hire sessionals and other faculty, as well as purchase the necessary instructional material necessary to deliver the program. And thirdly, this investment will help strengthen the connection between education and jobs. Graduates from this program have very strong career prospects. According to information compiled by the government of Alberta, the average salary for uh, veterinarians is over 90,000 annually. And according to the Government of Canada Job Bank, almost 90% of veterinarians are employed full time. Increasing spaces in this high demand occupation will ensure more young Albertans can find rewarding career opportunities right here at home. So again, in summary, it is clear this new investment will ensure the University of Calgary continues to excel in the field of veterinary medicine. In closing, I encourage all Albertans to find out more details about this incredible investment and more about the larger Alberta at Work initiative at alberta.ca. Thank you again, and uh, now I'd like to invite Minister Horner to provide a few remarks. Thank you, Minister Nicolaitis. And, and I just want to start, it's a pleasure to be uh, here today with you all, uh, with Premier Kenny, Minister Nicolaitis, to announce this important funding that will significantly impact our livestock sector. I know you're all well aware of the value our agriculture sector adds to Alberta's economy, our rural communities, and our province as a whole. And I thank you for investing in our sector and building capacity for this key resource our livestock producers rely on. In agriculture, people are our most important resource, and vets are no exception. Veterinarians and animal health technologists are pillars, not only of the agriculture industry, but also in the rural communities they serve. And I, I can attest to that. Our, our local veterinarian and her husband are, are uh, coaching uh, my kids in slow pitch and t-ball right, right now as we speak. But uh, veterinary medicine is a key sector in our economy especially in rural Alberta where we rely on veterinary medicine with a focus on livestock. Veterinarians also take on other roles that support our agriculture sector, like regulatory positions, animal health research, and work in the animal pharmaceutical industry. Modern agriculture is a highly skilled, highly technical occupation. Farmers and ranchers today are educated, innovative business people. They need the support of skilled experts like veterinarians to be successful. As a rancher myself, I've felt the impacts of our rural veterinarian shortage and see how it affects my neighbors, my constituents, and our industry. These investments of 8.4 million to expand enrollment and 59 million in capital funding for new infrastructure will support good jobs, help maintain animal health, and create even more opportunities for ambitious Albertans. This is a huge win for Alberta livestock producers, students, and our rural economy. Thank you all very much, and I'd let, now like to introduce Ed McCauley, the president of UFC. Thank you so much, uh, Premier, Ministers, uh, Dean Weller, Dr. Kirchick, Chancellor Yedlin, 
Welcome, and there are a number of distinguished guests in the, in the audience, major supporters from our community that we appreciate, and leaders in, in Alberta. It's really, really great to be here. Uh, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are making this announcement on the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta. This includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pakani, and Kanai First Nations, as well as Sutsina First Nation and the Stony Dakota, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nation. The city of Calgary, next door, is also home to Métis Nation of, of Alberta, Region 3. The city of Calgary is also home to the University of Calgary. And we've not only helped it learn, we've helped it prosper and grow. In fact, we contribute about 16.5 billion annually in economic impact. And I like to say that's because we're a place to actually start something as the entrepreneurial university. For example, just recently we announced that we're partner in the Energy Transition Center, upskilling and retraining energy workers in need of new jobs. Finding ways to produce energy with less carbon. And also with today's announcement, finding a way to ensure that Calgary remains the energy capital of Canada and never loses that title. Energy has been a big part of Calgary's economy and Alberta's economy for many, many years. But agriculture has too, for a very, very, very long time. Everybody knows we produce the best steak going. I mean, Alberta beef is world renowned. <laughs> But our agriculture sector is facing a tough problem. And thanks to today's announcement and this government's support, one the University of Calgary is going to help solve. Because if this important sector is going to keep going, it needs more vets. And thanks to today's announcement and this government's support, the University of Calgary is going to produce them. We're going to double the annual number of doctor of veterinary medicine seats to 100. Five starting this September, five more next year, and the remainder over the, uh, once the new facilities that today's announcement included will help build, which will be completed in 2024. We are fast tracking that. On behalf of everyone at the University of Calgary, I would like to thank the Premier and his government for their support and their confidence. It is well placed and I'll let the Dean of the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine speak to her faculty strengths in more detail. She, however, will be probably too modest to note that despite being the newest school in Canada, we are third in Canada and number 37 globally in just a few years, which is an amazing accomplishment. <laughs> Minister Nicolati has also referred to the fact that today's announcement is possible in part thanks to the gener generosity of Jack Anderson and Wynne Chisholm, who in 2019, 2018 gifted us the WA Ranches, a 19,000 acre cattle ranch just west of Calgary that offers students real world training and experiences. By helping more Albertan students study veterinary medicine right here at home, we'll be creating a pipeline of skill and knowledge that will help our agricultural sector grow. Nowhere will this be felt more than in rural Alberta. Because we're not an ivory tower kind of institution. Our veterinary medicine students get their hands dirty in rural farms and ranches across our province. So soon there will be more students, and in turn, soon after that, there will be more vets. That's what our agricultural industry needs, what our province needs, and what government is enabling with this support. Thank you again, Premier. And now I'd like to turn over the, the podium to invite the Dean of the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Dr. Renato Weller, to expand on the impact this support will have. Thank you, President McCauley, for that introduction. I don't think modesty is necessarily a main character trait of mine. I come from the number one vet school in the world, in London, and I will leave this only once we are number one here. So who of you has a dog or a cat or a rabbit or a guinea pig? A fair few people. And who of you likes to eat steak? Well, medium rare for me, but 
or a burger or a rotisserie chicken or some nice uh, cheese board after dinner. Well, let's face it, you can't do this without a vet. And you, can certainly, you can't certainly sell all those products without a veterinary certificate. And who of you here is kind of a little bit fed up by this, uh, with this pandemic? <laughs> yeah, I am. So again, for all of that, you need veterinary expertise. I have a fair few faculty members who know all about COVID because we've been battling COVID viruses in poultry and in cats for a long time. So talk to us, talk to us, we know what to do. So thank you very much to the government for giving us the opportunity, my team and myself, to tackle this veterinary shortage here. And globally, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. And I have to congratulate Alberta for taking initiative here. The rest of Canada is still talking about the problem. They will follow, but they're probably going to be, what, two or three years behind. <laughs> the next people who globally in North America who are jumping is Texas, and there's a reason for that as well. So as my colleagues here have already expanded on, it obviously plays a, a major role uh, in economy, as well as for social entertainment. I mean, who doesn't like going to the Stampede or Spruce Meadows, right? The social aspect of veterinary medicine and animal ownership uh, is certainly a given as well. Now, these gentlemen think I'm done here and I will go away. I'm not. <laughs> this is the long-term solution. You, you didn't really think that, right? I, <laughs> hope, I hope that it doesn't come as a surprise what's now coming. So we need some short and medium term solution. As the whole team at UFC, we are running as fast as we can, but we need a few years to produce those Albertan vets for Alberta. So in the meanwhile, I'm a global citizen. I'm born and bred in Bavaria. I spend a lot of time in California and London and so on. That's London, UK, not London, Ontario. So what we need is to import some talent. And uh, UFC, we, we are ready. We are ready to help onboarding those people. We already have plans for micro-credentials so we can make sure those people that come in fit the market. Uh, apologies for the corporate language. Uh, I mean, education is business, right, boss? It, it is. So, so we want to make sure our product fits the market. And. Uh, Premier, could I possibly borrow uh, Minister Horner and maybe Minister Taves for two weeks? And uh, Minister Nicolaitis, I mean, I don't know how well you sit a horse, but we, we are going on a recruitment drive. Uh, we, we get those vets here, and we also, we are going to flog some Alberta beef, shall we? <laughs> so let's do that. And I have to say one thing and be a bit serious about this. Uh, they, work, the collaborative work this province has shown, that's globally unheard of. I'm totally the envy of all the other deans, and I'm looking at a few people here in the audience who helped with this, my friends from the regulatory bodies, some industry involvement, thank you John for your help, uh, thank you uh, MLA Lovely for your help here, and we will continue this stakeholder liaison because we need that. We need to make sure our brilliant students are exactly what we need here. So thank you once again, everyone, and uh, looking forward with uh, working with you. The heavy lifting starts now, right? I mean, winning an election is one thing, but governing is another. <laughs> so thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Weller, for those words. It's an absolute honor to be sharing the podium and this historic day with you. Honorable Premier, Minister Nicolades, Minister Horner, Dr. Weller, Dr. McCauley, Emily Lovely, um, and welcome guests. I am honored to be here today as Dr. Natasha Kutrick. I am a proud rural veterinarian uh, Vice President of the ABVMA and a cattle farmer with my husband. I am honored to represent the 3,800 active veterinary medical professionals 
working in over 575 veterinary practices across our province, who are all excited about this historic announcement. I am pleased to be joined today by Dr. Daryl Dalton, the Registrar of the ABVMA. Sending their regards is Dr. Karen Melnick, President of the ABVTA, the Alberta Veterinary Technologist Association, and our ABVMA President, Dr. Mandrusiak. Dr. Mandrusiak really wanted to be here, but alas, duty called. Such is the life of a veterinarian. Best summed up by the well-known author and veterinarian James Harriet. I quote, animals are unpredictable things, and so our lives are unpredictable. It's a long tale of little triumphs and disasters, end quote. Well, today, I am here to celebrate a triumph that avoids a disaster. Honored guests, there have been some very rough days for our profession over the past few years. Labor shortages combined with COVID impacts and the raising demand for services have placed tremendous stress on the veterinary profession. As it's been said, this stress is not unique to Alberta, but globally, veterinarians are in short supply with educational investments not keeping pace with the surge in demand. Our foundational agriculture sectors and the security of our food supply is dependent on our veterinary profession. There has been perhaps no greater time when we are in need of help. But today in Alberta, there is a need for more than 865 veterinarians and veterinary technologists. By 2040, without any sustainable investment or action, that number is expected to grow more than three and a half times, leaving Alberta short more than 3,300 professionals. We are in a crisis. It has been a dire forecast until today, a day that represents a future of opportunity, a commitment of educational excellence and dedication to developing a profession that will contribute significantly to the growth and innovation in Alberta's economy. Today is a very good day for the veterinary profession, for Alberta animal owners, and for all Albertan children dreaming of one day becoming a veterinarian. Today's announcement of $8.4 million to expand the University of Calgary's Faculty of Veterinary Medicine from 50 to 100 students, with an additional $59 million in capital over the next three years, is historic. We have not seen this level of investment in the veterinary education and job creation in Alberta before. The Canadian veterinary community is taking notice of this Alberta leadership. Today, Premier, your government is fueling dreams and providing opportunities for Alberta students, wanting to pursue a career in what I think is the best profession, and I'm sure most of you will agree, is the best location, Alberta. Of course, having grown up in rural Alberta, and now as a large animal vet and farmer with my husband, I'm excited to promote a new generation of UCVM students going into rural practice and having a fulfilling life in rural Alberta. As we look to the future today, I stand proud to be part of the veterinary profession, one of the oldest professions that have shaped the Alberta economy since the early 1900s. Veterinary medicine touches everything from our furry companions and exotic pets to food producing livestock, wildlife, and even honeybees. We're also engaged in specialized and developing services such as education and animal disease research bridging human and animal health. Our association and our membership take pride in how our profession has been critical to Alberta's development and is helping to shape the future health and prosperity of our province. Today's announcement recognizes this critical role our professionals play. But today is also significant for another reason, because it is this investment into UCVM's infrastructure and the veterinary program that our profession feels heard and acknowledged by the government. April 30th marked the 2022 World Veterinary Day, which celebrates the contributions of veterinarians to the health of animals, people, and the environment. This year's theme, Strengthening Veterinary Resilience, celebrated the courage of our workforce who have been called to manage sometimes the impossible with most times limited help. 
Yet, they have remained committed to providing excellence in their work despite the growing demands and the mental health toll on going to the shortages that they have created. So today is significant for many reasons. On behalf of the ABVMA, I want to express thanks to many for their ongoing cooperation, collaboration, and dedication to finding sustainable solutions. Days like today happen because of the leadership and resilience of folks to do the right thing. Premier, you have listened, and acted doing the right thing for Albertans. By targeting investments here at Alberta's Veterinary School, you have given hope to many. I want to thank Minister Nicolades and Mr. Horner for listening and working diligently with us and UCVM. MLA Lovely has been a fierce advocate for the veterinary medicine profession in her constituency and rural Alberta. I'm sure any graduate of UCVM will be welcomed warmly into the Camrose community. As it's a neighbor community to my own constituency, MLA Lovely, I'm sure we can build an alliance and attract some of these graduates to northeastern Alberta. I also want to thank a few ministers who are not here, including Minister Taves, Minister Shandro, and Minister Copping, who have been steadfast in their support for the University of Calgary and the role of veterinary medicine to Alberta's agriculture sector, communities, and economy. Your bold and decisive action will positively impact Alberta for generations. Our profession thanks you. Today would also not happen without the tireless efforts and bold vision of many who came before me, including ABVMA past presidents, Dr. Greg Andrews, Dr. Lisa Lomsnest, Dr. Kirsten Arbo, and Dr. Pat Burge. We are also grateful for the support of leaders like Reeve Angela Albers, Councillor Gord Krebs, Dr. Melanie Woke, and Dr. Dave Chalak. Lastly, today would not have been possible without the bold vision and perseverance which you all just witnessed of Dr. Weller. She hit the ground running as soon as she came to Alberta, and most of us have been trying, but more likely failing, trying to keep up to her. <laughs> it is truly exciting and gratifying to see our vet school expanding under your exceptional leadership. We know the students are in the best of hands. Our profession welcomes the opportunity to support and work with you, Dr. Weller, your team, and your students, current and future. But we still have lots to work to do, including decreasing the shortages impacting our technologists, attracting the best veterinarians and technologists from around the world, and retaining our professionals before they burn out. But let that not dim the light of today. Today is an exciting day. Today is the triumphant day. I look forward to returning to UCVM to congratulate its graduates and welcome its new veterinary students. There is no better veterinary profession than veterinary medicine and no better place to practice than Alberta. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Kutrick. That concludes the formal portion of today's announcement. We'll now open the floor to a media Q&A. There is a microphone to the left of the line of cameras for all of our journalists who have gathered here today. I'd ask that you please uh, state your name and your outlet, and please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. With that, we'll get started. Harrison, thank you. Uh, Premier Kenny, uh, this one is for you. Uh, swift reaction flowing in from Ottawa at this moment uh, in regards to the, that court decision this morning. Uh, the Prime Minister says that Bill C-69, the Act, is actually predictable for the energy sector. <laughs> they say that uh, they're going to appeal this to the Supreme Court of Canada. So they, they're predicting a win. So what is your reaction to that? And what is the good news and that you can tell Albertans about Thanks. this? B before answering, I should have, I didn't see uh, my colleague MLA Jackie Lovely here. And thank you very much, Jackie, from being here from, from Camrose and for really being a, a, a champion for the project that we've just uh, announced. Well, Prime Minister Trudeau claims that this creates predictability for the energy sector. Then, then why did every major energy organization oppose Bill C-69? Why did they oppose it when it was before Parliament? And why did they intervene on Alberta's behalf to support uh, this constitutional challenge? Uh, he's just making that up. Uh, this is, we've called it the no more pipelines law for a reason, because it creates so much uncertainty that investors will not
put billions of dollars of shareholder money at risk for major projects that they do not know if, when, or why the federal government might bigfoot in and, tr and try to stop a major project. I mean, we saw what Bill C-69 looks like with the Energy East project after TransCanada had spent a billion dollars and several years on that project that would have allowed Canada to displace foreign oil imports, the Trudeau government forced the, the uh, National Energy Board to basically improvise a new set of regulations that caused TC Energy to walk away because of uncertainty. So uh, now, I said to Justin Trudeau, three days after I was sworn in as Premier, I met him in his office, I looked him in the eye and I said, you're making a huge mistake with this bill. It slams the Canadian economy, it drives investment away where it's already been fleeing, and it turns the Federation on its head. That same day, I met with the Senate committee that was examining the, the bill and made a passionate plea. I said, there is no way you would pass this if there was a strenuous objection, if it was attacking, let's say, the hydro industry or the aviation sector in Quebec at a, time, a sensitive time for national unity. You know what? The senators agreed with us. In fact, the Senate basically voted, and a majority of whose members were appointed by Prime Minister Trudeau, the Senate voted to basically gut the bill because they saw what the Alberta Appeal Court has seen in their four to one decision today, which is it, it, it is an obvious uh, attack on the concept of the Federation, the promise of the Federation in our Constitution. So Prime Minister Trudeau said he was confident he was going to win at this appeal court. Um, his, his position lost four to one. And I'll remind him that eight of the ten provinces of this Federation opposed the introduction of this bill. Maybe it's time to actually be a, a Prime Minister focused on national unity, jobs and growth, rather than driving disunity and hurting our economy. I apologize, Harrison. I didn't mention who I was. Tyson Fur with CTV. Uh, but a follow-up just from my colleagues uh, in Edmonton. This is a bit unrelated on that. But uh, there's some claims from uh, former UCP staffers that they were directed to use WhatsApp, personal phones, personal emails to avoid government uh, messaging and to have avoid VoIP requests. Uh, this came allegedly under the directive of your former employee, Matt Wolf. Are you aware of these allegations, and uh, what is your response to that? What I'm aware of is that uh, uh, ministers and political staff are instructed to carefully comply with the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act uh, to maintain relevant records uh, and to comply fully with the Act. I think you already know who I am, so I won't have to say Rick Bell from the Calgary Sun. Um, Premier, do you have any fear, talking about Bill C-69, do you have any fear that there's all this elation today and celebration and there will be in Alberta for this ruling, especially since it was so strongly worded and uh, was so decisive, do you have any fear that if it goes to Ottawa and goes to the Supreme Court of Canada and Alberta loses there, do you have any fear about what that will do to the already angry Albertans uh, who already feel very mistreated by the feds. So that if, you know, you won here, if you go there and then they lose, are you afraid this is just going to stoke further discontent with Trudeau, Ottawa, and the Eastern establishment? Well, Rick, I'm sorry, but I'm a, a glass half full kind of guy, and today my cup overfloweth. <laughs> I, I'm not going to walk down uh, your pessimistic road here. I instead am going to focus on doing everything we can to win at the Supreme Court of Canada, and that will start with my calls to fellow premiers uh, to encourage them to come in behind us as interveners. I got seven other provinces, uh, and I think two of the three territories, to join us back in December of 2019 in calling on the feds not to pass this law, this bad law. And we got the Senate. I, I was surprised, I've got to be honest with you, when I went down there in April of, uh, May of 2019 at, to lobby the Senate, I thought majority of these folks have been appointed by the Prime Minister, there's no way they're gonna listen to us. They did listen to Alberta and Quebec and, and 
the, uh, eight of the ten provinces. And they gutted the bill. Prime Minister Trudeau then used his Commons majority to overturn that. So I'm an optimist. And, you know, I'll, I'll remind you that um, uh, three of the uh, Supreme Court judges uh, are from the province of Quebec. And uh, they have a long record of being super sensitive to respecting the rules of the road in the Federation. So uh, we'll be working hard to get, as uh, a, I think, the vast majority of Canadian provinces backing up Alberta at the Supreme Court and groups representing the Canadian economy. We already had a bunch of them uh, at the Alberta Appeal Court. So I think these, this is a powerful decision. And by the way, it's not really a question of opinion. This is the Prime Minister seems to be missing this. Just go and read the letter of the law, the Constitution of Canada, the ultimate law, Section 92A. Provincial legislatures have the exclusive authority to regulate the production of natural resources, including oil, gas, and forestry. Period. Full stop. So the PM is, is um, entitled to have his political views, but he's not entitled to ignore the supreme law of the land. That's what Alberta's appeal court said today. That's the message we'll be driving in the months to come. And on another topic very quickly, because um, I know you have many other questions, uh, what do you say to these allegations of uh, Mr. Jean and his uh, people that there was something untoward in the selling of memberships uh, uh, for the leadership, and especially timely, because I think tomorrow is the last day that memberships can I be accepted. I just think that's uh, more silliness. Um, uh, the yes side of that campaign used the approved party process with an online portal to submit uh, applications for membership that people had paid for, that they signed. Uh, we had an internal audit process to ensure that was the case. Uh, we actually went back and did a retroactive audit. The party has all of the paperwork to prove that. Mr. Gene himself used an online portal uh, to process some 600 memberships in his uh, nomination campaign. Uh, it's the normal process. Uh, the, we, we've carefully followed all the rules. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm focused on fighting for this province, uh, not um, more distractions like that. Okay, thanks, Rick. I uh, don't see any other journalists on the floor here, so we're going to hop over to the uh, phones for some questions. Operator, can you please connect our first call? Catherine Zagowski, Alberta Today. Oh, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, so earlier this year, the, the rural municipalities of Alberta passed a resolution, and they actually called for the creation of a rural practitioner stream at the university. And with this funding announcement, I don't, I don't see any dedicated stream for rural vets. Uh, why is that? Well, first of all, thank you for an on-topic question. Um, <laughs> miracles will never cease. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to refer that to folks from the U of C and, and Minister Nicolaides. I, I will say, though, I really was inspired by Dr. Uh, Weller's vision of making this the top med veterinary medical institute in the world, but also using immigration and re overseas recruitment as a tool to address the severe skilled labor shortage amongst vets, especially large animal vets for the um, rural economy. I will say this, we, we've already launched deep reforms of Al the Alberta Immigrant Nominee Program, which we've rebranded the Alberta Advantage Immigration Program, to focus on recruiting and, and settling newcomers in rural communities, recognizing that we've got enough people in Edmonton and Calgary, but Many rural communities are struggling with population stagnation and decline, particularly in uh, certain in-demand skilled professions like large animal vets. So the rural renewal stream of the Alberta Advantage Immigration Plan is all, basically says that we are going to um, select newcomers to the greatest extent possible who are committed to going and living in uh, working and, and starting businesses in rural communities. And we're going to fast track those. So if, if, doc, if Dr. Weller and, and our government are successful in identifying vets who want to move to uh, Alberta, um, I don't know if you, you probably want some to come work in this faculty as well, but we will 
uh, do what we can through that Alberta immigration strategy to get them here as quickly as we can, set up. And you know, there, there's also a succession crisis. We talked about the current shortage of, of large animal vets especially. Um, a lot of the ones who are still working are, well, I hear stories, I, I've met vets in their 70s who had planned to be retired by now, but they can't, if they abandon their practice, first of all, they have no one to sell it to. And uh, so they'd lose the equity they developed in their practice. And secondly, uh, if they left their practice, there'd be nobody to care for the large animals in their part of Alberta. And these are very conscientious people who are fo um, devoted to animal welfare and they don't want to, to create that situation. So if we can bring uh, large animal vets from abroad into uh, some of those rural communities and connect them to some of the baby boomer uh, big animal vets who are looking to retire, then they can buy those practices and maintain those services. But I'll invite others who might have a, a comments on this. Thank you for that question. So if you double the numbers of your student, you also need to look at your curriculum. And certainly going forward, uh, what we will do, we look at uh, streaming. And what I would like to see happening is a rural stream and an urban stream. And the rural stream, we are talking about large animal practitioners and absolutely uh, in the rural stream, the focus will be on large animals. However, these people also, they're the true James Harriots. They also need to be able to spay a cat or neuter a dog. So they are going to be uh, the, the rural practitioners that can service all of the animal related uh, needs in those, uh, in those communities. We have already, and the credit goes to my ADA, uh, uh, Dr. McCorkle here, we have already started changing the admission criteria, going somewhat away from uh, the pure academic, uh, well, they need to be clever. It's a very demanding course, I have to say that. But we are also looking at other, other uh, traits here. And uh, trust me, I have a fair few people here in the room who keep me on, on my toes, including David Jalek, who I'm looking forward on our continuous, robust conversation about gender distribution in the, in the profession. Um, so we are working on that. Now, I come from a rural area, I've worked in a rural area, and it's stressful to be on your own out there, especially when it's cold and dark. And what we are also going to do and what we are working on is a support network, a tele-support network where uh, we can provide from here the clinical and personal mentorship those people need. The shortage is a, a leaky bucket phenomenon. So we have true expansion of the sector, but we also have attrition. Attrition due to retirement, but also attrition due to uh, stress, early attrition, unnecessarily so. So we, we, this is our core business. As a university, this is what we do. We mentor people. We mentor our students so we can relatively easily also provide that for a profession. And we are working with the ABVMA uh, on this so we can provide this and keep those admittedly relatively expensive graduates, somewhat, uh, to keep them in, in the profession longer uh, and, and let them have a fulfilled uh, work life. Thank you. And uh, Catherine, did you have a follow-up at all? I do. Um, for either Dr. Kutrick or uh, Minister Horner, you mentioned um, some of the hardships out there um, amid this rural shortage. Can you, can you paint the picture of what's at stake here, um, either through um, animal diseases or um, the, the animal welfare, what happens on the ground when there is the shortage of vets? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I just would start by saying, uh, in your first question, you spoke about uh, the resolution put forward by the RMA, the Rural Municipalities Association. Uh, just wanted to comment on that. You know, this has been one of the number one asks, not only from the rural municipalities, because they know how important it is to their communities, uh, the Alberta beef producers, the cattle feeders, because this, this is a core uh, uh, pillar in, in almost every rural community. So the animal welfare consequences that you're asking about, they're, they're very real. 
uh, but so are the consequences to these rural communities. Uh, veterinarians have a, especially large animal vets in remote rural Alberta. It's a, it's a, very, it's a very demanding, tough uh, lifestyle. You're, as Dr. Weller said, you're alone a lot. Uh, the suicide rates are high. You've gone to school for a very long time. Uh, it maybe it maybe isn't always as as uh, as rewarding as, as you'd hoped. Um, I hope that's not the case, but it's difficult. Is is my point? So it's people, it's it's animals, uh, animal welfare, and, and it's communities. So uh, I hope. Uh, I hope that uh, Dr. Weller's comments show everyone that this is just a commitment and a great first step. It's going to take a, a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach and it will take years. And we are competing against other jurisdictions. This is a global global challenge. Uh, so we'll, we'll all need to, to work together. You know, that, that's why I'm here as the, as the Minister of, of Agriculture. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not my department. I'm very thankful for the Premier and the Minister of Advanced Education's uh, commitment to, to trying to solve this problem, but but also as they mentioned, uh, you know, Minister of Finance, Labor and Immigration. It's it's going to take all of government to, to continue to solve uh, solve this issue. Uh, but I, I would ask for uh, help on the follow-up there. Thank you very much for that question. Um, if you could read my diary for the last eight years of being a large animal vet, you'd read lots and lots of details. Um, but I do want to clarify, although we're in a crisis, um, people should not be worried about not being able to seek veterinary medicine. Um, all animals are still being tended to, but what that looks like for our, our farmers and those in agriculture, it means um, longer drives to different practices, it means longer wait times, it means longer nights and days by veterinarians, which to Dr. Weller's point um, is part of the leaky bucket, that stress and demand on them. So we hope this step will help by bringing new graduates into the workforce and other initiatives that we're working on, um, such as support networks, um, better mobilizations of our registered technologists, and uh, a bunch of other task force that many, many people are working very, very hard on. Thank you, Dr. Kutrick. Uh, operator, can you please put through our next caller? Brian Mullen, Global News. Good afternoon, Premier. I have a question about energy profits. Suncor is the latest to report record profits this quarter relating to the high price of oil. Obviously, uh, the government has a huge stake in what they do with these profits. What would you like these companies uh, to do in terms of investment with this cash? Well, we would love to see uh, an increase in their investments in uh, upstream exploration and production, new greenfield uh, projects in the oil sands to uh, create more jobs in Alberta. <clears throat> As I've said recently, uh, we're concerned that these uh, very strong commodity prices and big profits are not turning into jobs. I think because of the labor shortages, we're going to see, we are seeing uh, higher pay and, and uh, benefits and better compensation for contractors uh, in the sector, that's a positive for sure. But even though Alberta employment went up by about uh, 22,000 jobs in the last two months, employment in oil and gas went down. Now some of that's the spring turnaround reduction and typical spring reduction in, in drilling, but it's also a reflection of relatively modest uh, investments in capital. Now I understand that the industry was devastated in 2020 with the price collapse, that they're coming off of several tough years, that they're under investor pressure to um, strengthen their balance sheets, pay down debt, uh, increase dividends, and buy back shares. And it, it's not for the government to dictate their financial strategy, but Alberta owns the resource that they develop. They have the privilege of developing the resource that belongs to Albertans, and Albertans rightly expect to see real economic benefit, particularly when prices and profits are this high. So I would renew my uh, urge, I, I once again urge uh, those companies to uh, invest in the future uh, of the industry in a meaningful way. And Brian, do you have a... And, and I should say, you know, one of the, sorry, uh, uh, Harrison, one reason I understand there's been a hesitancy to pursue new greenfield uh, major projects has been the uh, Impact Assessment Act, Bill C-69, and the uncertainty it created 
about the possibility the feds could bigfoot in here and block a project like they were about to do, like they did with the tech resources mine. So um, I would say that uh, today's uh, decision is an important step forward, I hope, in renewing investor confidence for major investments in the future. Okay, thank you, Premier. Uh, Brian, do and you have a Thank you, Premier. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, as far as uh, carbon capture projects, if companies don't invest in these projects, would Alberta consider provincial incentives beyond what Ottawa is offering? Well, we are already are providing very substantial support. First of all, Alberta's government was a world leader in promoting CCUS technology as early as 12 years ago, and we did it as the first jurisdiction in North America with a levy on industrial uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We've invested over $1.8 billion uh, to really create the initial infrastructure, including the uh, Alberta Carbon Trunk Line. Um, that's one of the reasons the world is beating a path to our door for potential hydrogen, low-emitting hydrogen and petrochemical projects. If the oil sands companies uh, proceed with a, a pathways plan with a major upscaling of carbon capture and sequestration, uh, we'll be supporting it by providing billions of dollars in offsets uh, for their uh, royalties payable for every dollar of eligible capital investment. That is to say, if, if, if company X puts a, a billion dollars into a CCS project, uh, that's a billion, and it's eligible, that's a billion dollars off the royalties they pay Alberta. So that's already a massive uh, contribution. In addition, I remind them, we provided all Alberta businesses uh, with a one-third reduction in the general tax rate, which uh, represents, again, a very significant contribution to them um, getting their balance sheets in order. So uh, Alberta's already been there in a huge way. Uh, if, if these companies are committed to that, they're going to have to put some real skin in the game. And I believe they can and will with the 50% federal investment tax credit, in addition to the offset on royalties for those uh, expenses. Thank you, Premier. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? Sydney Roquette, Radio Canada. Bonjour, Monsieur Kenny. Uh, je vais vous demander votre réaction en français sur uh, la décision de la Cour d'appel de l'Alberta. Sure. Just uh, for non-francophones, the question is for me to respond in, in uh, French to the decision today. La décision de Cour d'appel de l'Alberta aujourd'hui, c'est une victoire historique pour l'Alberta dans la lutte pour notre uh, place dans la fédération, pour uh, notre économie, pour les emplois. J'ai dit au Premier ministre en 2019 que c'était une grande erreur d'imposer ce projet de loi C-69 sans l'approbation ni les consultations avec les provinces, même le Sénat. La majorité du Sénat était d'accord avec nous autres. Ils ont accepté toutes les modifications proposées par l'Alberta au projet de loi C-69. Et alors aujourd'hui, par une majorité de 4 à 1, La Cour d'appel de l'Alberta a dit effectivement que euh, cette loi fédérale représente une menace à la Fédération canadienne et euh, ils ont dit que, euh, euh, avec cette loi, le Canada ne sera plus une vraie fédération. Alors, je lance un appel à, à toutes les provinces pour se joindre à nous pour défendre la Constitution canadienne, notre économie et notre Constitution, la, la substance de notre fédération. Euh, et j'espère que le Premier ministre va écouter aux, presque toutes les provinces et territoires, au Sénat et à la Cour d'appel de l'Alberta. And you have a follow-up today? Euh, que répondez-vous euh, au, au Premier ministre Justin Trudeau qui donc a dit qu'il allait déjà aller en, en appel en citant notamment ce qui s'était passé avec la taxe fédérale sur le carbone où la Cour d'appel de l'Alberta vous avait donné raison, mais la Cour suprême avait donné raison au gouvernement du Canada. C'est un cas euh, différent, c'est un sujet différent et la, la euh jurisprudence en ce qui concerne la taxe sur le carbone est, est une question beaucoup plus complexe. Mais ce que n'est pas complexe est la lettre de la Constitution canadienne, la section 92A, qui était une victoire 
essentielles du premier ministre Lockheed, sans lesquelles l'Alberta n'aurait pas signé la Constitution en 82, sans lesquelles nous aurions été avec le premier ministre Lévesque à cette époque-là, contre la, contre la patria, patriation de la Constitution. Parce que cette section-là, ça dit que euh, les provinces ont la juridiction exclusive sur la réglementation de ressources naturelles, y compris le gaz et euh, le pétrole. Alors, ça, c'est effectivement la base de la décision de la Cour d'appel aujourd'hui. Et je constate qu'une grande majorité des provinces et des organismes de l'industrie seront à notre côté uh, sur uh, l'appel à la Cour suprême du Canada. And I'll just add that point, which is in English, which is that um, Peter Lougheed's consent to the patriation of the Constitution on behalf of Alberta in 1982 was contingent on the inclusion of that Section 92A, exclusive provincial jurisdiction over the development of natural resources. Alberta would have been like Quebec under René Levesque's leadership outside of the 1982 Constitution had it not been uh, for that power, which was reaffirmed powerfully today uh, by the Alberta Appeal Court. So this, as they said, and I'll it bears quoting once again, the unavoidable effect of the federal act would be the centralization of the governance of Canada to the point this country would no longer be recognized as a real federation. The Prime Minister came to office promising a cooperative federalism. Well, this is the test. He doesn't have to appeal this. He can listen to the court and to the majority of provinces. We hope that he does. Thank you, Premier. Operator, can you please put through our next caller? There are no other questions on the line at this time. 